good. What's one piece of advice would you give to like young writers coming up? Hmm. If you're writing for yourself, put yourself into it. Meaning like write about you. Mm. Like do not be, don't never think, the thing that I think that happens with writers is we write for the listener. We don't necessarily write our self into the records. So I always tell people like, there is nobody who has your experiences, your life, your memories. Like there's a reason why you live the way you live, why you went the way you went. Write about yours. Mm. Because at the end of the day, there's somebody else who feels that way. They might not have lived it, but they feel that way. So be mindful of that because I feel like a lot of times as writers, we we want to just tell a story that feels familiar. We want to tell a story that, you know, somebody else might have lived. I'm like, nah, live yours, mm -hmm. write yours. So as writers, like, do that. And honestly, just don't stop. It's going to get weird. It's going to get hard. It's going to get difficult. It's going to get impossible. Just don't stop. <laughs>
in the beginning, you know, it was just like, you know, I'm, I'm tinkering with the sound, trying to figure it out, trying to figure out what the sound means, who my audience is, and those type of things. But when I really got the chance to work with her, I was like, oh, okay, I get it. Like, this is a whole thing. Like, you got to build a machine behind it to make it move. And, you know what I mean? Like, the blessing for me is like, I was already building the machine, but just not knowing that's what it was. Mm. You know what I mean? I was already kind of doing a little bit of everything and already had kind of like my background in everything. So when it came to actually being an artist and standing in front and, you know, one thing that I really just get complimented on is that like, I know what I want and who I am. And that's mm. because I spent the time to really flesh it out, figure it out. You know, and once I got to that point, I was like, oh, I'm good. And I see, I'm more so curious about you personally because I feel like, I think you don't have a lot of stuff on YouTube. Like, I think it was mm -hmm. like one interview, but it was like old. It was with some white guy or something like that. Yeah, and you look yeah. super young. Yeah. You look way different. Like, you don't even look like <laughs> the same person. That's why I was wondering, like, you definitely put, I don't want to say more because it was one interview. Mm -hmm. Who knows? You could have just been chilling. Mm -hmm. But it was like, it seems like you put more into the image, more into the brand itself. Yeah, yeah. And I was wondering, did that come over the time, over the years? And this is like way past, because mm -hmm. now it's four years. I yeah, mean, it's very when did, when did you When did you start to say, I have to be more intentional with my brand and my image? I think once, once I signed the recording, Joe. I think for me, like, mm. I just went into it knowing that, you know what I mean, now you're you're the face of it. So once you become the face, you also got to be, you know, the image. So once I really, you know, put that in perspective, I was like, ah, right, you know, I'm, I gotta hit the gym. I gotta, you know, get get different gear. I gotta, like, you know, what I mean, I gotta really paint the picture for myself and for like, you know, those involved. Because for me, like, it's really important that what you see is is really what you're getting. Like, you mm. know, what I mean, I never wanted to be somebody who was faking what I was or trying to be more than I was trying to be. I wanted it to be very clear that I'm, you know, the individual that I am and the artist that I am is very much so someone that matches with the art that I'm creating. Now, was that you or was that the was that the record label pushing it on you or was uh, it kind of both that was always me really that was always me like everything about me is is very much so something i designed mm. none of this is by accident like i don't mm. i you know what i mean i didn't go into this you know with anybody looking to influence me like i'm an artist you know what i mean so at the end of the day like this is my art so i take mm. it you know what i mean i take it like incredibly seriously so for me i had to be very intentional because at the end of the day i realized if i don't know what I am and who I am, they're going to tell me mm. who I am and what I am. And that's the worst thing you can do. Because then you're going to have to be pigeonholed to whatever it is they paint for you. And if that's not you, and they paint it for you, like, you're going to be dan you be gonna be dancing a song that you ain't, you know, you ain't even right. That's a fact. Yeah, I'm curious to know how, how much of your your upbringing, how much of an impact that has on your writing and your music. Because, like, you have a, yeah. a <laughs> deep history of, like, just... Shit. Yeah. yeah. That went down, right? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. How much that impact the music that you write and make? Yeah. Like, you know, me, I immigrated from, from Ghana when I was like four years old. Um, migrated first to Greensboro, North Carolina, then moved to Worcester, Massachusetts. And just like, you know, traveling around a lot and just kind of like being really um, like latchkey even as a kid when, you know, like my parents would work all the time. So I was just always the kid who was kind of raised by my other friends. Mm. So, you know what I mean? I grew up with like Haitians, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans. So like my upbringing was very mixed and very cultural. So I really got to express myself in different ways. And then growing up in Worcester, I got to really grow up very Ghanaian because it has one of the most highest Ghanaian populations. So I got I got a real cultural experience growing up, and and because of that experience, like it, it influenced the type of records I made. Because mm. now looking back on it, I'm like, wow, like I'm really leaning in on the culture that I was raised with. You know what I mean? Like I get I got reference points that a lot of people wouldn't have just because of the people I grew up with, mm. and you know, and the friends and the family that I had. So I feel like yeah, my upbringing was was monumental to kind of like the style and 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 the subject matter that I write about because you know I try to write from a place of experience. I try not to write about stuff I don't know. I try to write, you know, as much stuff as I can, like from things that I've actually done and I've actually said. So that's why it's important for me, like with the upbringing that I have, to really be mindful of that and just, it's just easy to be truthful. You know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's harder to maintain a lie than it is to maintain the truth. That's a fact. You know? Yo, how much of that, like your upbringing and coming here under your circumstances, mm -hmm. like how, when you started to hang with, have American friends and mm -hmm. things like that, how much did it, it uh, plague your mind or like, you started to, to look at, did you start to look at Americans differently? Because like you really had it bad and I ain't gonna lie, mm -hmm. people over here, like we always claim like we, we yeah. got it bad. We think, <laughs> we think we got it bad. And I was just listening to your story. I'm like, damn, like nah, yeah. you really yeah, it's had different... to persevere through some things. Yeah, um, I, I think like for me growing up, like I didn't really know 
how tough I had it until like I got older mm. and I started realizing like, oh, I can't drive a car or, right. oh, I can't get an apartment in my name or I can't. Visa. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So there were certain things that I really couldn't do. And then you start realizing that a lot of those things are the things that make you feel like an adult as you're growing up. You know what I mean? Because when you're 16, that's how you become independent. When you get your license and you're able to get in a car, get and go you know, or get a job, you know what I mean? And be able to like, Buy your own sneakers we'll play and soccer, right? go play soccer. You know what I mean? I'll, listen, you know, it's, so there's a lot of things where you like you realize, like, man, like those nine numbers mean something. You know what I mean? I couldn't open a bank account. Mm. You know what I mean? So even if I had a little summer job on the side, I couldn't really save the bread. So it was it was just really interesting to kind of like learn what type of limitations I would have to experience because of these numbers. Mm. So it put a lot of things in perspective for me. But what it also did is. It showed me that there's a whole underground society within the United States. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of people who are in my situation. There's a lot of people who don't have paperwork. There's a lot of people who got to move kind of under the radar, whether that's because of immigration or because of, like, their own, like, you know, felonies and records and things like that. So, like, there's a lot of people that I started realizing, like, like you know, the street dudes embraced me because you know what I mean because of the fact that they kind of lived in a in very underground world as well. So I started I started realizing there was so many like dualities, but there are also so many commonalities with me and like you know the homie that was just on a block with a felony and couldn't work and and couldn't get a job and he couldn't do certain things. And I was like, I right, cool. So I got it and I understood it. So you know what I mean. But it, it definitely put in perspective for me like with with Americans. I was like, this is such a crazy country because it's all about like what you put in right it's mm -hmm. about like how bad you want it so i just realized like even if you want it bad enough like sometimes it's other things that limit you right. you know what i mean but for me like i got lucky you know what i mean i got really blessed because like my work ethic was always kind of something that i always got rewarded for you know what i mean i was just i just know how to put my head down and grind so i never really concerned myself with limitations it's crazy because even like just hearing your story you hear so many like americans are like so judgmental but it's so easy to be judgmental when you're not in that situation. Like mm -hmm. you said, like you you ended up being one of the, not one of the people from the streets, mm -hmm. but almost one of a kind mm -hmm. because well, one, one like them because mm -hmm. y'all had the same experiences. Mm -hmm. But it's so quick to like to judge somebody like that. But it's like, bro, you really never know somebody's mm -hmm. situation. But mm -hmm. it's so quick to be like, I would never or mm -hmm. Man, I could never. Listen. Like you really never know until you're in that situation. And I, and I love, and it made me gain such a respect because you know what I mean? Like growing up, my my parents are always the ones that you know when you when you're an immigrant right your only interpretation of the people around you is like the news television things like that so when my parents are watching the news we know news in America is skewed yeah. you know what I mean so it's like when we're we're sitting watching the news it's like this black kid robbed the store today and this black kid did this and this Spanish kid did this so immediately you know what I mean it's an immigrant coming in and you don't know nobody know nothing you're watching the news and you're thinking all black kids are doing this you know what I mean so it's like for me really to get the opportunity to just like really, you know, chill with these people, talk to these people, grow up with these people. I'm like, man, like all that stuff they be putting on the news is wild, bro. Yeah. Like, And it's the sell stuff. It's just like Instagram. Yeah. Think about it. Everything I sell, it seems like it, it be just bullshit. Mm -hmm. So they're going to put it on the news so they can get ratings, so they can, mm -hmm. people can watch it. They're going to sell these whack-ass stories. Mm -hmm. They might give you something positive. And, but they're trying to scare you into watching. Yeah, it's like, it's ridiculous, yeah. bro. Like, yeah. It's and when I really understood it, I was just like, oh, like, all oh, this is just propaganda. Mm. Like, this is all them just selling images. And it's the same thing on the reverse. And, like, you know what I mean? Like, black Americans have the same idea of, like, when you see Africans, you're like, oh, they all grow up in huts or they live mm. in the jungle or they, you know, got animals walking around everywhere. It's like, you forget it's billionaires in Africa, yeah, bro. Yeah, Africa's like, probably one of the most beautiful places bro, in the world. In the I haven't world. even been yet. I just see pictures Listen, and videos. Put, put them stamps in your passport, bro. Whenever, <laughs> yeah, exactly whenever you're ready, bro. Facts, whenever you I, ready. Need that. I need that one for, for real, sure. Man. Yo, nah, it's crazy. So I want. I did want to talk to you about this, Um, going back into the, the Beyonce thing, mm -hmm. right? And writing for Beyonce. So the way you explain this writing camp, it sounds like a... I'm trying to stop cruising. It sounds like a... a like one of them sweatshops. The way Bruh. the way it's explained. It, 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 but it's not it's it's more like it's more like she got the Avengers together. In fact, I mean yeah, like, I mean, you know what I mean? But it's like everybody in one yeah. building writing is like, okay, cool. You write some. Is that good? That's, that's camps. good. Come in the room. That's that's music camps, bro. Like camps, they'll literally put you in different rooms, and it's like we're gonna match you with this producer today. We're gonna match you with this writer today, and it's just like we're, it's like speed dating. That's mm. the better way to describe it. It's like speed dating. It's like I'm gonna get this person to match with this producer, and we're gonna see how that works. We're gonna get this writer to work with this producer, see how that works. And a lot of the times, what you realize is like. Man, like creativity is about combination, right? It's about collaboration, but right. it's like if you gotta have the right combination 
of writers and producers to work together in order to make that work. Mm. Because if you don't have that, then it's like, that's how you can't really, you know, find the magic of things. Because, like, human beings, like, we're all about energy and frequencies and all that. So it's like you put the wrong people in the room, you can have the wrong energy and wrong frequencies. You know what I mean? So I got really lucky with that camp because everybody in that camp, like I said, was, like, one of them. You know what I mean? There were special writers, special yeah, producers. Like, Psh, bro, the... you got it was like to watch people go in and out, in when, and out. When did Burner Boy drop? Uh, what was the album that I had last last one there? Oh, uh, that had to be after 2019. Yeah, it's definitely after 2019. So you you kind of like didn't even know that when he blew up. I would say after when he dropped. But you understand, like being an African, I'm going to the. Oh, pub. you already knew. I already know. That's imagine being mean. next to Bur- well, not you. But yeah. Imagine like somebody being next to Burner Boy, not knowing that like that's Burner. That's, yeah. the, that's what's gonna to be. He's about to cultivate a whole like yeah. different. Yeah. Damn. And, and he was, and it's like it's it's so interesting now to see what Afrobeats has become. What? Because I was one of those kids that you know I'm I'm going to the African parties, I'm going to the African weddings, I'm going to the African funerals, and they're playing this music. You know what I mean? So I'm hearing the music before any of my friends are really getting it and understanding what it is and what it means to the culture. So like, you know what I mean? I'm one of the first people who's sitting there and I'm like, yo, this Afrobeat stuff is coming. And everyone's like, okay, whatever. Like, you know what I mean? But to see it become what it is now, I'm like, okay. It's no, it's it's almost like unfathomable or even just, I can't even find a word to think about it because Afrobeat really might be my favorite genre of music right now. Cause you know what it is? It's the happiest genre. Mm, it's it's that. happy, bro. It's a vibe. And everything else is just like everything's toxic. Like even when you look at like R and B, for example, right? And you look at like artists, like there's a lot of like toxicity. Everybody talking about, you know, my man cheated or I'm about to go run up on this shorty. And like it's like everything's about like either the sexualization or this toxic nature of relationships. But like Afrobeats are still talking about love. But um, uh, if you know what they say, it's, it'd be a lot of they be talking about a lot they of boys. Too, but it still, but it's still it good. feels good. You know what I mean? Like it feels it good because at the end of the day, you want like people want to be happy. Facts. That's but that's crazy how like you're right because they could be talking about the most the most gangster. Mm-hmm. Shit, but it still just sound like just, a vibe. Like just, I don't even know what they're saying. <laughs> it just sound like a vibe. Like, yeah, it's yeah, crazy. Yeah, rhythm is is just, tempo and rhythm is an amazing thing. That's a fact, bro. I mean, this might sound like the most cliche question yeah, ever, good. but like. We always we heard Biggie say like mm-hmm. I remember uh what was it rapping the hard the hard never thought that hip hop would make it this far. far. Would you ever think that like Afro beats will make it yeah. this far? Nah nah not like this. That's not, it's not like insane. selling out arenas and 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 that kind stadiums. of like, stadiums. Stadiums. <laughs> and it's like it's, Beyonce. Type yeah, vibes. and it's and it's but I knew that the music could do that. Mm. I didn't know what the artist would look like. I didn't know what kind of person they would take, but I knew. That the music was that big. I can see that. I always knew that. You know, so it's special. Yo, this episode is sponsored by the Morning Meetup. Man, shout out to my guy David Shines, man. He's probably one of the few people I know who actually built multiple multi-million dollar businesses, right? He created the Morning Meetup to help other entrepreneurs do the same thing. Now listen, as an entrepreneur myself, I know how hard it can get, especially when we start making money and we get to like this financial cap that we can't get past. And honestly, let's be real. They say it ain't what you know, it's who you know. We probably can't get past this cap because we either, one, outgrew the people around us, or two, we just being lazy and weighing in the rooms we need to be in. It's just plain and simple. But trust me, this is your time because the morning meetup is that room we got to be in. It's filled with with entrepreneurs getting to it. They reading different books every month, right? They holding each other accountable. And it's just honestly just something dope to be a part of. So listen, if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to get to this bag, you're trying to flourish more than you've been flourishing now... You got to go to the morningmeetup.com. That's www.themorningmeetup.com and join now. Let's get to it. I see you there. Special. So where are you at with it now? Are you still? Because first of all, first of all, that's Rowan. Because mm-hmm. you wrote for so many other people. Yeah. Other than Beyonce. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jadenda. Yeah, I wrote for Jadenda, Akon, Mr. Probs, BB Rexa, Tiwa Savage, DeVito. Did this come after the Beyonce? No, nah, this was all before. Yeah. Damn. You know what I mean? So, so you've like, been him for real. I've been just, I've just been plugging, you know what I mean? Like for me, like it was just, it was, I'm always the type of person where it's like, I always put it in basketball terms, right? I can't, I can't drop 80 on you if I don't take 80 shots. Like, you know what I mean? Like I got to keep shooting. Mm-hmm. So for me, like I'm never in a place where I'm not shooting. I'm Like even as an artist now, I'm still shooting. 
But you was young, bro. Like, how did you even get into that? Like, before we even get to Beyonce, right? Like, how yeah. did you even get to writing for all these other artists? Honestly, God lining it up. You know what I mean? Like, because I, I had a friend um, from the city I'm from, Worcester, and um, he was, like, one of the biggest producers in our city. And he moved to L.A. to kind of, you know, cut his teeth in L.A. and try to figure it out. And I remember we were um, working on a friend of mine's album named Sam James. Um, and, you know, we really was just, like, we're halfway through the album, we're wrapping it up, and then when we get to finish the album, literally 24 hours after we finish the album, he gets signed to you know to Sony. Like literally, I, I go to sleep, I wake up, and the man signed to Sony, and it was just like, oh, this is how quick this happens. So as soon as that happened, I took that situation and I went and got a publishing deal with, with Primary Wave and, and BMG, and that publishing deal really started putting me in writing rooms. Mm -hmm. Really started like, you know, I, I moved to New York for a couple of months, then moved to LA for a couple of months, and I was just really, you know, doing any and every session because, you know, like my daddy told me, like at the end of the day, even if a man is richer than you, more talented than you, like you work harder, work than, harder than that. You know what I mean? So like there's few people that could really like in my mind outwork me. Like I was doing like three sessions a day. I was doing like 18, 19, 20 hours in the studio. You had to get burned out. Yeah, like, yeah. But, but you know what I mean? But like, I feel like I burnt out at the right time. Meaning like, you know what I mean? I had a, I had a daughter in 2016. So when I had my daughter, it was like, shut it down. Mm. You know, so, but it was the perfect time for me to shut it down because things were starting to slow down for me. And then I really started realizing like, yo, the only way I'm going to be able to stay relevant and still chase this dream is I got to figure out a way to record from the crib. Because at that point, I was just going into studio sessions. So, I, you know, I had the blessing of being able to go into these really, you know, major historical studios that everybody been working out of in L.A. So when I got home, I was like, yo, there's no studio like that here in the crib. There's no engineers like that. Like, so for me, I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to have to teach myself how to record. So then I spent the next year literally teaching myself how to record. I bought a computer, bought a mic, bought an interface. And I just said, you know what, I'm going to figure it out. And... You know, lo and behold, that that year and a half, almost two years, really turned into what ended up being the records that I sent to the Beyonce camp to kind of be mm. like, you know, this is what I could do. You know, so like like I said, everything kind of lines itself up the way it's supposed to. Bro, they say, you know, success is when preparation meets opportunity. 100%. And those two years was the preparation time. 100%. And even the fact that like, it's like, you really are an inspiration. Again, I've never even been to Massachusetts, mm -hmm. but I don't hear too much coming out of there. <laughs> yeah. um, except for like the Celtics and I mean- Yeah, the Patriots. The and, Patriots yeah. is like close to up there, right? So mm -hmm. I was gonna say, when it comes to music and artists, I don't hear too much coming out of that. The only the only artists from, from my city, like my city specifically, cause you know, Boston's a whole different arena. But is uh, is me and Jordan Lucas. Mm. Yeah, I, I didn't mean, even know Jordan Lucas was from, yeah, from there. Stuff. Yeah. But the fact that you and him too, because he's definitely putting on. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you can sit here and say, like, man, I'm from Massachusetts. I wrote for Beyonce. Mm -hmm. I wrote for Akon. Mm -hmm. It's iconic. It got to be like, man, that's kind of like a badge of honor. And yeah. yesterday, they got to salute you differently. Yeah. Like, like, the crazy thing about my city, was, and I'm always going to I'm always gonna love my city for this, is like, my city helped me up. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, like, I have a line in one of my songs where I'm like, like, even if I never made it, they'll still tell everybody that I'm the GOAT. Mm. Like you know what I mean? Because they're the ones that that gave me that. They're the ones that told me I was good. They were they're the ones that gave me the pat on the back. Because there's times as a writer, as a creator, where you're like, "Am I crazy? Am I really? Yes. Am I really? You know what I mean? Doing this right? Am I going the right way?" And they never let me fall. Like, but I mean, to be honest, speaking to that point, not to cut you off, you, you gotta. I feel like as an artist, as a good artist, mm -hmm. you gotta have some type of insanity. Of in course, you, right? Because it's like who. Bro, the things we do, all of us, like the things we do on a con constant basis, getting no money, you got to be some type of retarded. Like, <laughs> it's gam it, I, always say, I always tell people it's like, it's like gambling in Vegas, right? It's like you think about somebody who really religiously gambles in Vegas. Like you're going to lose a lot more than you win. Mm. But just that fact that you could win is all you need to keep gambling. Oh, man, you know what I mean? So for right. me, like I've. I've just always gambled. I've always, but I, I always try to be smart with my gambles. I've just try to. My goal is like never go home, mm. right? That's that's the thing. Just don't go home. Don't right. quit. Don't stop. And if you keep shooting, at some point, bro, you gonna hit one. One one come in. You know what I mean? It's crazy because like even like when I was in college, I played or whatever. And, um, Who'd you play? Uh, Q. Okay. So okay. like, one. It's funny like coming out of it like ten years now, but I always would tell people like, man, the hardest thing is just to come back. 
right? Like the night is, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's hard, but like that ain't like the hardest thing to come back because it's mental. Mm-hmm. But once like, you in it, you might as well stay there. Mm-hmm. Same with everything, like bro. The hardest thing is just to keep going, mm-hmm. but just keep going. Mm-hmm. It sounds so cliche or crazy, but it's, but it's like, bro, it's are truth. we here now? Like, don't focus on like I think people focus on the destination when you should focus on the road. Like, mm. just like I've I've just been taught, you know, close your eyes and just and just push, like literally close your eyes and push, and then everything else will just come. Facts. Like you know, what I mean, like my father has this quote where he says, you know, he who climbs well deserves a push, mm. and the whole meaning behind it is like, yo, if you just climb well, if you just you know bust your ass, work hard. Somebody else will be there to bless you. God will be there to pull up. You know? Yo, I've heard people say, um, you know, blessed and a little bit of luck sometimes mm-hmm. when they talk about that journey. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it, when you said that, it, the first thing that came to my mind because it's like that, that's what happens when mm-hmm. you put in that work. You go and stumble on something, mm-hmm. right? You like There's you said, no way you, you shoot hundred free, <laughs> free throws. You gonna hit one. You gonna hit at least one. Damn, but all right. So speaking of this badge of honor, right? Yeah, that's from Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. But now we talk about. Ghana, mm-hmm. and even like you, you moved to Liberia at one point. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, when I first was when I was a kid, my family moved to Liberia, Monrovia, and then the civil war breaks out in Liberia, yeah. and that's what made my family immigrate to the U.S. Like, bro, yeah, it's Liberia. like it's wild now. But even like just Africa as a whole, right? Yeah. That gotta be like a a badger on it, like a, a burden on your mm-hmm, back, mm-hmm. almost like man, I'm putting on for okay, Massachusetts is a state. Mm-hmm. I'm putting on for a whole continent. Mm-hmm. I said it right, right? Whole country. Country, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm putting on for a whole country. Okay. That's different. Yeah. Yeah. It's like for me, you know what it is for we me? We ain't gonna like... leave that out either. Y'all got it. Y'all got it. You clip it up. You know what I'm saying? Y'all got it. But for me, like it's the reason why it's important is because I know what um I know what I'm coming from, right? So I know there's also a group of Ghanaian kids or a population of Ghanaian kids that are looking at me and being like and, and able to tell their parents. I don't have to be a doctor, an engineer, or a lawyer to be successful. There's other routes to success. And for me, that was always the most important part was to show people that it's not necessarily about what you do, it's how you do it. Mm. So it's never been about being the doctor, being the lawyer, it's just being the work ethic, being the workhorse. Like really, no matter what you do, if you outwork anybody, like at the end of the day, you're gonna be at the top of it. Now you could say that though, but you know your parents, they gonna hate that, and their parents. No, they, they, they my, want you to be doctors. And, they did. I know. Africans they did like that. Until, until I was able to prove my theory. Facts. You feel what I'm saying? Because don't get me wrong. Like, my, listen, my middle sister is an accountant. My other sister just received her PhD. Mm-hmm. So you know what I mean. So it's there. It's there. You know what I mean. But for me, like it was the the agreement that my me and my parents had was like, yo, go to school. You know what I mean. Get your you know get your degrees. But if this is what you want to chase, just know that your degrees is your plan B. Mm-hmm. And I always went into it like, I right, I'm gonna do this for my folks. But at the same time, like there is no plan B for me. Like, yeah, that's cool. I got the degree, but it's like, this is what I really want to do. So when I really got into the music and really started, you know, working for it, I was like, you know what? At the end of the day, I must approach this like I have no plan B. Mm. I have to approach this like this is all I got. And it and it was. Like, it was tough. Don't get me wrong. Like, there's, there's moments when I was just broke. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm talking like really, you know, broke. Like, I was homeless in L.A. for a while. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I fought for everything. Like, everything that I ever got was, you know, was for a reason and, and for me like being where I am now I'm still hungry like I still there's still something else that I want like I'm not at the place that I feel like I'm supposed to be at so when I get there you know maybe then I can kind of sit back but for now like I'm on it you know what I mean when you dropping music now what uh, was your last so the, the latest project is uh Ghana Must Go which is the EP that I just dropped mm-hmm. um under Warner um the first you know first EP um and it's 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 you know it's dope it's dope it's like it's a great feeling to really finally be able to share art and share musical people mm. you know because I don't you know you don't get that opportunity often you know not on this type of scale no in fact and I especially like I feel like a lot of writers don't get the credit they deserve mm-hmm. and then when they do start getting the credit from the masses mm-hmm. I feel like this is how I look at it I feel like if you into music you know good writers mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. but what happens is like they start making music let's say I don't know like. Neo, mm-hmm. right? When he started making music, everybody that knew, knew music, they was like, "Oh, that's Neo." Mm-hmm. But like for me and the, mm-hmm. the rest of the people, we're like, "Oh, this nigga dope." Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. like, "Bro, you ain't know him." So yeah. I feel like same thing with Bruno Mars. Yeah, it's like mm-hmm. when you when you when you a writer, like the people stamp you, but it ain't really until you get that that worldwide mm-hmm. stamp that it feels some, feels like something. Mm-hmm. So I can see how it could still feel like you got a chip on your shoulder, even though, I mean, you wrote for Jadena, Akon. Fucking Beyonce, mm-hmm. uh, T. What Savage? It's just mm-hmm. like it's just crazy, but it still gotta feel like man. Uh... Because you don't know me, right? You know what I mean. You know my music. 
but you don't know me. Right. So for me, it's always gonna be this chip, this thing. Because even like I'm, and I'm always good at moving the goalpost, right? Like mm-hmm. even when I get there, I'm still gonna find something else to be like, I need that. Right. You know what I mean? So that's how I'm always gonna be. And like my over, like my, I always told people, like people are like, what's your goal in life? And I'm like. I kind of want to be an EGOT. Like I want to, mm-hmm. I want to have the Emmy. I want to have a Grammy. I want to have an Oscar. I want to have a Tony, because I want to be one of the only African born, you know, what I mean, people to be able to pull that off mm-hmm. and to be able to look back and be like, yo, I did it for all levels of entertainment. Like it wasn't just me singing songs. It wasn't just me acting. It's all of it. Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean, and once I get to that point, then I'm like, all right, cool. Was uh, I never do this, but I just think it's just I'm compelled to do it this time. You're good. What's one piece of advice would you give to like? young writers coming up Hmm. if you're writing for yourself put yourself into it meaning like write about you Mm. like do not be don't never think the thing that i think that happens with writers is we write for the listener we don't necessarily write our self into the records so i always tell people like there is nobody who has your experiences your life your memories like there's a reason why you live the way you live why you went the way you went write about yours mm. because at the end of the day there's somebody else who feels that way they might not have lived it but they feel that way so be mindful of that because i feel like a lot of times as writers we we want to just tell a story that feels familiar we want to tell a story that you know somebody else might have lived and like nah live yours mm. write yours so as writers like do that and honestly just don't stop it's going to get weird. It's going to get hard. It's going to get difficult. It's going to get impossible. Just don't stop. No, I rock with it, bro. I appreciate the conversation. This is good, man. man I appreciate For the people you, that man. don't know, let them know how to follow you, how to connect with you and all that. I try to keep it simple. You know what I mean? All socials is uh, Lord Africana. That's L-O-R-D-A-F-R-I-X-A-N-A. And um, yeah, you know, hit me up. Talk to me. I'll talk back. You know what I mean? I'm not one of those guys. You know what I mean? I like to interact with people. I like to chop it up. So, you know, check out the EP, Ghana Must Go, and let me know what y'all think. This was good, man. J Hill, J Hill Podcast is right. We out. Yes, sir. That was fine, bro. I appreciate, appreciate you, it, man. I appreciate you.